Good morning. I think there's a story there. And when I retire, I'll take your class. Good morning and welcome to Chats with Champions. I have to say that this is the happiest group I ever stood in front of. My wonderful crew today. Chats with Champions is sponsored by Sherman's Main Coast Bookshop. You'll see them sitting out here selling you books. You've written the books. So you have to decide if you're going to buy them. <laughs> and this morning, we are lucky to have Barbara Burt and her memoir writers and their book, From Memory to Memoir. Barbara leads the Memory to Memoir workshops and is a longtime area resident and a member of the Transformational Language Arts Network. She weaves her background in writing, editing, education, communications, leadership, and music and believes in the therapeutic value of personal narrative. Please welcome this wonderful group of people. Yay. Yeah, I want to I thank those of you who made it out uh, for coming. That's great. I was telling Chris that when I play in a musical group, the, the measure of success is when the audience is larger than the group. So I think they did that. <laughs> On a serious note, I want to thank also the people you're going to hear stories from because it takes a lot of courage to tell a personal story and even more courage to have it printed in a book and, wow, super courage to come up in front of people and read it. And stories are really important. They connect us in so many ways and they bridge so many differences. I think, I think this morning as I was driving here, I was thinking of the two yous Stories are unique. Everybody's story you'll find is very different from everybody else's. But they're also somehow universal. Even if you never had that experience, you've had some experience like that. And so listening to someone tell about that brings out a corresponding response from you. And it's, it's an important and it's a wonderful human connection. I think that's why we developed speech, so we could tell stories. So, not to take up too much time up from storytelling, I'm going to introduce the first, the first reader, who is Sharon Hebert. She is, Sharon is a Red Sox fan. Oh, excellent. She's from Nobleboro. There are seven different local towns uh, represented here, which is really interesting, I think. And she's going to read a story called View from the Top Bunk, which doesn't give you any clue about what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Barb. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I drew the short straw, but <laughs> somehow, unbeknownst to me, I drew the short straw to be first. Um, View from the Top Bunk is a very interesting story. It took place in, I grew up in Brunswick, Brunswick and Hartswell. Oh, sorry. I'm a little dangerous with the mic because I, I may break into a nice country western song. <laughs> so, my sisters and I, in this little house on Harpswell Road in Brunswick, shared a bedroom. In that room, we had a set of bunk beds and a twin bed, and I, being the youngest, was relegated to the top bunk, which I was thrilled about. I, right at my head was the window where I got to watch shooting stars in the night, snowstorms in the morning, which allowed me to announce no school days, <laughs> along with the comings and goings of our neighbors. One summer morning, I awoke early to sounds I had never heard before and have never heard since. Clanging of heavy metal objects, vehicles revving up and stopping, before revving up again. Is my voice going in and out? No, no. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Muffled voices were speaking just below yelling. I lay there for a couple of minutes trying to figure out what my five-year-old ears were hearing. Finally, I lifted the curtain and what a sight. I thought I must be dreaming. The circus had come to town. Oh my gosh. Right across from our house was Poulin's Field, if you know Brunswick at all. <clears throat> not just to my town, but to my very neighborhood. And not just to my neighborhood, but right across the street from our house 
in the big field where we played ball in the summer and skated in the winter when the rain and the cold would cooperate. It felt like Christmas. Several tents had already been erected and the workers were scurrying around, dumping the metal pipes wherever needed, along with big bright rolls of canvas that were being unfolded and hoisted to form the remaining tents. I quickly woke up my sisters and brother and we wolfed breakfast and raced across the street to watch all the action. We lived in a big neighborhood, so there were immediately a dozen kids on the outskirts with eyes as big as saucers watching a circus be created magically on our old playing field. We were quickly exiled to the very edge of the field, out of the way of vehicles and workers, but that was okay. It was Monday morning, and the circus was due to open on Tuesday, so there was much to see. My brother, being the enterprising one of us, was 11 years old, and he soon took me aside with his scheme to raise money. Since our house was so close and our yard was so large, we would set up a parking lot. <laughs> and we would man a booth at the end of the driveway and charge a dollar a day to park. <laughs> We got the tape measure out and got to work marking the spaces with stakes, measuring to see how many we could fit, and soon our whole yard was cordoned off for parking 15 cars at a time. He calculated that we would make 20 to $30 a day. People would be coming and going all day. The circus was scheduled to run Tuesday through Saturday. Count it up, people. <laughs> Five days of 20 to $30 a day? We'd be rich. On Tuesday, my brother manned the booth at the end of the driveway while I got to wave a red flag our mother had made for us that showed every car where to park to maximize space. Now, I must admit, I was excited about our venture, and painting the sign was excellent fun, but I was so worried about missing the circus events. But I need not have worried, because each day our lot filled by 10.30 in the morning, and we took down our sign, pocketed our money, and crossed the street to enjoy the fun. Part of that fun was collecting the manure that the animals left. <laughs> My mother had told us she would give us a dollar for every wheelbarrow load of manure we brought home for the garden. So we kept our eyes and our noses open for dropped loads, scooped them up with our shovels, and hid the wheelbarrow in the bushes till it was full. <laughs> Add that to our riches and the circus was proving to be a very profitable adventure. <laughs> After the first full day of shows, we happened upon another money-making opportunity. Hundreds of people wandering around counting coins for rides, popcorn, fat lady viewing, giant snake exhibitions, fairway shows, naughty peak shows, burgers and hot dogs and cotton candy, invariably dropped a lot of coins, and most of them were quarters. We kids would venture over every evening after the shows and scavenge the ground for anything shiny. We wished that circus would stay for a month. We figured at the end of that time we could buy a new car for our parents, and maybe even a bigger house. But the circus came and went in one week. Our yard became a yard again. We counted our coffee can of money and we had brought in a total of $127 in five days. I sadly watched from my top bunk through bleary eyes as the circus came down, metal pipe by metal pipe. Tents would stoop and kneel before finally falling flat. The pipes would clang, the muffled voices would bark out orders. And as I fell asleep to the lulls of that noise, vehicles pulled out of the field and the adventure was gone, never to return. It was like a dream, one that has never been, 
nor will ever be forgotten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The next reader is Bob Crick, who um, is a photographer, lives in Edgecombe, and the name of his story is Love. I came into being on January 12, 1936, during a blizzard in Watsika, Illinois. Watsika is about 90 miles straight south of Chicago. My first memory is seeing fireworks from a baby carriage. Fast forward four years, four years old, living in Wilmington, Delaware. 1940 classic American family. Father, <coughs> mother, older sister, and baby on the way. My father was a structural engineer at DuPont. I played guns with my best friend Jerry Fleming. I remember Sunday, December 7th, 1941, hearing the news on the radio about Pearl Harbor. <coughs> my younger sister was born later that year. I was sick every year with hay fever, sinus trouble, and then asthma. I had to have my nose drained every fall, silver nitrate up my nose with cotton balls. Not fun. <laughs> because of the allergy problems, we moved in 1944 to Cleveland Heights, Ohio, where I entered the third grade at Noble Road Elementary School. It was a one mile walk, actually one mile one tenth walk to school with many twists and turns, and that's real. I got lost on my first, on my first day home, on the first day. I walked back to the school and fortunately made it to my aunt's house two blocks from the school. After that, I settled to a normal life. A classic family routine, right out of the movies. They had off to work about eight o'clock in the morning, one car in the family, mother's routine, Monday wash day, Tuesday iron, you can't remember other days except Friday was cleaning day. Dad, uh, let's see, mother changed out of her house dress at 4 p.m. and would start dinner. Dad arrived home about 5.30, changed out of his suit and tie and his sports shirt and slacks. Dinner was on table at 5.50, meat overcooked, potatoes, vegetables, <laughs> fresh bread that dad picked up in a back bakery on the way home salad, jello with lettuce and salad dressing, and dessert. I don't remember the conversation, but all the food in our plates had to be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> you know, starving people at my, my father was a true engineer, everything in place and always on time, neither of which I followed very well. He was a classic father of that time who did not show any emotions. He was good, but aloof and very seldom positive. I know he loved me because many weekends he would get, he would take me out to my cousin's house in the country. My cousin was the same age as me and an only child with a dog and a cat and a room to roam. We never had any pets in our house. Mm. Fast forward to senior year in high school. I was not the best student in courses I did not like. I was on the track team as a quarter miler. I wasn't outstanding, but did have many third place finishes. My dad saw me run once near where he worked, and I came in third. Fortunately, I was accepted to Peru University by hook or crook. I graduated in four years with a BS in mechanical engineering. By the way, I have another story in there that has another big thing about that. Always fascinated by cars, I was offered a job outside Detroit Chevrolet Engineering in their training program. My dad predicted that I would return home within two years, but I stayed there my whole career, almost 41 years. By the way, this jacket will hear in a minute. This is, dates from about 1959. Mm -hmm. One year after starting Chevrolet, I offered, called my dad and told him I wanted to return my mother's car that I was in the process of buying to buy a new one. Instead, I was going to buy a 59 Corvette. Oh, yeah. Uh, which cost, I figured out recently, which cost basically half of my yearly salary. <laughs> off, and, and this shirt, or this jacket, I got, by the way, the khakis, the shirt, these are the same things I started wearing in college in the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they, don't, they don't go to that time. But so, uh, so I had to change that way. 
anyway. Uh, anyway, so he offered to loan, my dad offered to loan me money at half the going interest rate. I accepted and we had a deal. I still wish I owned that car. Oh, yeah. I, uh, inter interesting little side light. I had to decide between a four speed Ford or a hard top, a second top, and because it was going to be my only car living outside of Detroit, I took the top and, and had the three speed. Fast forward again in 1987. The Corvette is long gone. I married in 1984, or wait, 1964, and had four children. Now the oldest two are in college, and my parents have retired to Scottsdale, Arizona. <clears throat> my dad has late stage prostate cancer, is in a nursing home. My wife earned her RN at age 39 as a hospice nurse. She was one of the first ones in the country. She was the third one in the state of Michigan, and that was the second hospice in the country. Those are two little sidelines. It's not in here. My, okay, my, <coughs> early in 1998, she suggested she sh we should fly out to see my dad before he dies. I agree, and we have a very good visit. Even though he is in pain during our final pro private conversation, I, I tell him I love him. And he said, I love you too, for the very first time. Wow. Wow. So our next uh, reader is Kitty Hartford, who currently lives in Booth Bay Harbor, but I think you were an East Booth Bay mm -hmm. resident for a long time. Um, Kitty is going to read a very interesting story titled, My, My, kind of. <laughs> and she's going to sit right here. The other title is, Towing the Line. It was way too military for me, the pacifist, granddaughter of a Quaker who joined Daniel Berrigan in throwing blood red paint onto a bad ironworks destroyer and housed the Buddhist world peace marchers at her spacious village home with a plan to lead them through the gates of Maine Yankee. I was able to persuade my grandmother that our plutonium was used to produce energy, not nuclear warheads, and the marchers' efforts would have, been, would have had more impact at the IW. I certainly compromised my pacifist values when, in 1981, I took the job at Maine Yankee Nuclear Power Plant as an armed security officer. I would be required to carry a loaded gun and take an oath to shoot at a human being in the event of a situation. Even toy guns were forbidden in my home. But I was newly divorced for the second time, with three kids, living with my sister and her family, and I was trying to buy a house. The mortgage company required a six-month work history. Maine Yankee's security company had to fill a quota by hiring women. Affirmative action, hooray! <laughs> the pay and the perks were better than what the local rope factory had to offer and would offset the half-hour commute from the school day to Wisconsin. I was more accustomed to working for myself, or as an independent contractor, or a private duty practical nurse, or a freelancer, a tutor, a direct marketing salesperson. But it would be temporary. I'd keep looking for a better job, perhaps even a career. But for now, I would be a badge number, number 38, my age just one member of a well-trained squadron that would muster before beginning each shift. We were expected to follow orders, shoot first, and ask questions later. I did pass the firing range course with flying colors, cringing while aiming the double-barreled shotgun at a silhouette. Why couldn't they use a simple bullseye target? <laughs> when we lined up, with the toes of our spit-polished black shoes touching the line on the floor of the day room, I mentally crossed my fingers behind my back while reciting the oath. Chief Moore ex inspected our haircuts, just touching the collar in the back for women, no sideburns or beards for the men. After all, gas masks had to fit snugly. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Black clip-on neckties straight, trouser creases sharp, insignia pins and badges on the left shirt pocket, weapons clean, bandolier with 18 <coughs> rounds centered over the belt buckle, radio holstered on the left, handcuffs clipped onto the back of the belt, key ring on the right beside the loaded Magnum 357 revolver. The brass initials <coughs> MY were pinned on the tip of each shirt collar. We would be sent home without pay if they were missing. My, my. <laughs> <laughs> each security officer checked the bulletin board for his or her rotation schedule and relieved the outgoing guard at the first post of the ship. My favorite assignment was Tower 3, where I sat in a round glass perch atop a tall metal tube for two hours, watching the spent fuel pool, the main gate, the turbine hall door, <coughs> and, on the day shift, the cormorants drying their wings on the ledges of Monson <laughs> Bay. We were allowed to listen to the radio in the towers, remove our heavy gun milk, smoke, and eat. We were not allowed to read or nap, but we all did anyway. <laughs> On the graveyard shift, some of us wore a sleep mask to block the glare of the floodlights. <laughs> the men got a kind of a perverted kick out of displaying a Playboy magazine on the steel shelf opened up to the centerfold when they knew the relief guard coming up the ladder was a female. Oh. On the inside patrol position, my job was to do a walkthrough of the entire coal side and 50% of the hot side of the plant checking the locks on each one of the dozens of key-carded doors, radioing the codes to the dispatcher at each checkpoint, and looking for anything out of order or suspicious. It took one hour of brisk walking and climbing several three-story staircases. If there were any delays, such as setting off a radiation detector and having to remove a shoe that picked up a hot chip, a standby guard would fill in and finish the patrol. Only once during my four-year stint was there an incident that warranted a lockdown. And that was the result of a prankster leaving a fake ransom note on the floor of the spent fuel pool. Probably an inside job. <laughs> Likely one of our own guards. <laughs> Possibly the same jokester who left a note in the suggestion box that said, Widen the turnstile. Signed, Kitty. <laughs> Outside patrol involved first driving around the perimeter in a large state body truck with six gears to shift if I could get up enough speed, then alarming the fence by running a stick along each chain link panel while the dispatcher's voice repeated alarm, reset, alarm, reset, alarm, reset. If there were doors or gates that were propped open for refueling or repairs, guards were posted in the doorways for one-hour shifts, round the clock, sometimes for several months. When the saltwater intake filter screen was raked free of seaweed and green crabs, a guard was posted there in case, God forbid, an intruder attempted to swim into the open pipe and take a hostage or bomb the plant. <laughs> We received double time and half pay on the 12-hour graveyard shifts during the annual <coughs> period. I wore only my uniform and my pajamas those months. In winter, I had to don a heavy snowmobile, snowmobile suit for outside patrol, which meant removing my gun belt and bandolier. And I had to do this under the supervision of the chief because while I struggled into the awkward suit, I was unarmed. <laughs> Despite the job's indignities, large and small, during those four years at Maine Yankee, I bought shares in Central Maine Power, the plant's primary owner. I purchased my house. I spent all those hours in towers studying for my real estate license. <laughs> Biting the bullet and towing the line was worth it. <laughs> things we do. <laughs>
Our next reader writer is also an artist. Pat McCold lives in East Booth Bay. Um, she actually brought um, some examples of the beautiful pins that she makes. She's wearing one too um, that you should take a look at on your on your way out. Pat's going to read three short pieces to us, and she'll tell us the titles. Oh, thank you all for coming. This is very exciting. <laughs> um, the first piece is a short poem called The Ego is the Mind's Belief that it is totally alone. It, that's from A Course in Miracles by Dr. Helen Schulman. Is the turkey that greeted this morning's me the same as we? His great iridescent black beard feathers hang down nine inches from mid-breast. Are turkey feathers so different from hair and nails? Well, yes and no. All made from the same basic ancient matter. His sound was more than a gobble. A tickle, tickle, laughing explosion. <laughs> With gilded feathers and checkered sides, a red eye stared a moment, not long enough to photograph. He strutted on behind the goat shed, vanished in the marsh, <clears throat> then showed himself proud. He crossed the road in front of my red car without my camera. <laughs> <laughs> This is called Working Together. The dryer is on top of the washer in the narrow path between the stairs and the desk. In other words, it was really in the way. <laughs> the screws that held the machines together had been removed. We have to take the dryer off the top so the repairman can work on the washer, says my husband with authority. Otherwise, he said, the serviceman might just walk away and refuse to work on the washer because he will say it is not his job to be moving machines that impede his actual work. Okay, I'll help. Though I think it should not be my job to move the dryer. Suppose I was here alone. I certainly would not be capable of moving the huge, heavy dryer by myself. But I would still expect the surface man to be prepared to repair the washer, having been informed that we had a stacking set, and they were indeed stacked. <laughs> Don't you remember the last service person who refused to work on a machine unless it was freestanding? I think we have to be ready for that contingency and have the washer ready. I want to move this dryer. Okay then I'll cooperate with you and help move this very heavy, awkward dryer. Though, I don't agree that we should have to do it. <laughs> so let's go. I don't want to spend any more time talking about it. I can't get around the machine or lift it unless you twist it so that the corner is more away from me. Like this, he says, as he pulls the bulky machine towards himself while telling me to say what I was doing. I I'm trying to lift, too heavy. I'm trying to lift the dryer, but I'm short, and the bottom of the dryer is too high for me to get any leverage. He is still pulling the machine toward him, <laughs> so, I can't, so I can get a grip when we hear a loud crack. Ooh. He says, it just broke. <laughs> I keep trying to lift my corner side while he continues pulling. I can't anticipate where the machine is heading, and he keeps repeating with increasing inflection, just say what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to lift. Okay. I've got it up a couple of inches. You're moving. I take three steps, <coughs> keeping the dryer legs over the holding attachment on top of the washer. Are we putting it on the floor? Down? Here? Kick the laundry basket out of the way. <laughs> okay, put it down. Nothing appeared broken. I felt I had been working blind. I couldn't say what I planned to do. It depended on his unspoken moves. <coughs> 
how often we worked together like this. <laughs> Remember, I say, tell the serviceman about the poor balance every time the machine spins. I know you don't think anything can be done, but I disagree. Please talk to him. He will be here between four and five. I won't be here. Right, he says. <laughs> A small binge. And someone did point out to me that that really is an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> 8 30 to 11 p.m. is the hardest time. I'm not hungry, but I want something sweet, a treat. Maybe I should have my flax meal and some yogurt, just a quarter cup of yogurt, not too many calories, or better yet, kefir with all those good bacteria. And is a really special treat, a teaspoon of my friend's honey. Stirred together, it is delicious. It meets my brain center for pleasure. So maybe I can have a skinny rice cracker with a teaspoon of peanut butter. <laughs> Not a tablespoon, which would be a lot. <laughs> and top it off with a tiny spoon of the fresh raspberry jam that's on the counter. <laughs> yes. That should be perfect, and not too bad for a little supplemental snack. Pleasure center happy. <laughs> what else is at hand? <laughs> Some chocolate. <laughs> Just one square. Well, two then. And a fudgesicle. So cooling and sweet. Throw away the wrapper so you don't leave any evidence. <laughs> there isn't any ice cream. I really have had too much already. But just another spoon of peanut butter with raisins on top would be so satisfying with its texture and the requisite chewing. Then maybe I'll be able to stop. I'll put the peanut butter away this time. And I'll brush my teeth and put in my retainer and stay out of the kitchen from now till I get in bed. Someone else will have to let the dog out and back in. I just can't pass those chocolate cookies if I see them. <laughs> Addiction is a difficult thing. The piece of the brain which demands more pleasure is never satisfied. Where is rehab for sweets? <laughs> Hidden chocolate, ice cream, Nuts. <laughs> <laughs>
from the center of West Southport Village. This hillside parcel had a beautiful view of the Sheepskit River, but I had a concern that we would be feeling isolated in the woods, and that might not be the best place for my children to experience island life in a small coastal Maine community. When my friend Sarah suggested that the former home of the local clergy was vacant, just waiting for someone who cared enough to give it the attention that it deserved, I had the house inspected, so I would know what the maintenance challenges would be, and I put in an offer, and it was accepted. Soon I would begin to discover island life from the perspective of a new resident who came from away, but one who brought, had bought a simple house, an old one, in a village, not a showy place near the coveted shoreline. Constructed in 1914 with the help of Methodist parishioners, this modest single home was a show place in its day. An example of fine craftsmanship, its peaked roof lines with its broad overhanging edges gave a structure of a Victorian flair. Finials adorn the columns that support the roof as it sweeps down to shade the front porch. Perhaps the builders wanted to give the house a little character of its own, making the parsonage just a little bit different from any other home on the island. In 1954, after 40 years of faithful service, the church trustees sold their parsonage to the first of a series of private owners. The church's membership roles could no longer meet the minimum numbers imposed by the leadership of the Methodist Conference. It did not seem to matter to the conference administrators that a little island with only a small local congregation might want its religious roots to remain strong. One pastor was assigned to serve both the Southport and the Booth Bay Harbor Methodist churches. Providing an island home for the pastor became an extravagance that the Southport congregation could no longer afford. The parsonage became one of a cluster of family homes in the village. Its facade would change over time, but it would always hold the memories of a simple time in the island's past. A white fence and colorful garden now form the gentle border between the island's bustling west side road and the quiet space of the grassy yard. Out front, a single lane dirt driveway meanders through the neighboring properties and down to the tidal shoreline. Across the dirt drive to the south is an overgrown field, formerly a pasture for the neighbor's cow. The Weber family had owned this land for generations. Their old white farmhouse and one of two weathered barns still stand like placeholders of a time gone by. Over a hundred years ago, a Weber ancestor had given an acre of her land to the church, and the Methodist parsonage was built between the Weber family farmhouse and the west side road. A large rectangular rock now sits in the front yard of the former parsonage. The mason suggested that the granite block that was too big for the stairs that he was building might be just right to serve as a seat next to the roadside garden. Perhaps it will attract some neighbors and visitors as they walk down the road, beckoning them to stop and chat for a bit. It's a good way to meet people and to hear a few good stories, he said to me. A very thought of listening to the voices of local folks fed my desire to understand why I had chosen this island space in which to plant my own roots. Southport was to become a place to contemplate the beauty of nature, the importance of relationships. I had found a piece of heaven and welcoming community in which to raise my children. The old parsonage was now my family home. We filled it with a collection of furnishings and treasures and photographs that had arrived that first fall in the moving van from my parents' former home in Virginia. Early that spring, I drove across the Southport Swing Bridge after a three-hour trip from our weekday house in the city to my paradise home on the island. As the tires of my old Volvo wagon clattered across the steel bridge deck, the words, I'm home, came clearly into my brain. I was on Southport Island in search of a piece of me that had been missing in the long cold winter, a chance to reconnect with my inner spirit in a place that I felt comfortable and safe. The warm sun, the salt air, would soon melt a little bit of dusting of the snow that I found on the ground that spring day. The garden beckoned my attention, even before I opened the back door of the house and went in. As I pulled the remaining stems and dried leaves from last year's plants, a new growth was visible in the soil below. Looking back at a patch of iris, I was certain that they had grown, even an inch, in the warmth of that afternoon's sun. As I sat on a rock by the edge of the garden, I understood why it was time to clear the gardens of last year's growth and give them a new season in which to prosper. 
My first day as an island resident, I met Mr. and Mrs. Taylor, who lived in the old farmhouse just down the dirt driveway. Alvina was the last of the Weber family to live on the family farm. Together, Maurice and Alvina were two of the last island residents to truly live off of the land. His passion for gardening and her skill at canning provided the mainstay of their year-round food supply. Their water came from a dug well that often went dry in the summer, but the fire chief would check on the well, and when needed, he would back a tank truck down the dirt driveway, fill the old well, raising the water table enough to get them by for a while. Mrs. Taylor always had a tin of candy and some good stories to tell my children. Mr. Taylor would leave his black leather shoes on the porch, and he would go garden in his bare feet. He told me that his feet could sense the quality of the soil, its moisture, its sandy composition, letting him know when it was ready to be planted in the spring. In the summer, he said the warmth of the soil felt good on his nearly old toes. In the fall, he would feel the chill in the soil, and he knew it was time to finish the harvest so that they would have food for the winter. His old wheelbarrow stood by his side, holding the stalks and the roots from the vegetables he gathered. When he was ready, he carried a bucket of produce into the house for his wife, Albina, to prepare. Mrs. Taylor was the first to move into nursing care in the harbor. Mr. Taylor stuck it out for a little while on his own, alone at the old farmhouse. When I saw him working in the garden, I would go down to say hello and listen for his reassurance that he had food for dinner and he did have water in the well. He would tell me of his visits to see his wife and how much he missed her. He was always quick to add that he, she was getting very good care and much better than he could have provided for her at their home. Mr. Taylor took ill. His daughter arranged for him to share a room with his wife at the care center. I missed my neighbors, and when I stopped by to see them in town, they would be resting, their beds positioned side by side, and they were head to toe. <laughs> they were still together, I heard, when he died, and they were holding hands. Mr. Taylor's black shoes, however, were still on the front porch <laughs> when his daughter put the family's white farmhouse up for sale. In the 2003 Southport Annual Report, it was dedicated to Maurice W. Taylor with the following inscription. Coming to the island to visit his sister Winona Rand, Morris met and married Albina Weber. He served his country during World War II as a CB in the Pacific Arena. Upon his return, they made their home here and he became a carpenter and a caregiver. He was justly proud of his gardens and took pride in providing the potatoes for the fire department chief's supper every year. A few years after I moved in, I'd arranged for some old electrical wiring to be replaced. The electrician was a dear friend and someone with a long history of service to the island community. He was retired, but he was very willing to take this job. One afternoon, I thought Ralph might have finished for the day, as I did not hear him moving around the house. I found him in the living room. He was standing in front of the fireplace. He was looking at his watch. He told me that he and Marilyn had been married in that exact spot, exactly to the minute 50 years before. Mm -hmm. I knew why he timed to stay the way he did. Mm -hmm. Being in that house that day had given Ralph a gift, one that I had no idea of until that moment. Chris, the hygienist at the local dentist office, and her husband had once been the owners of the old parsonage. Each time I visit her office, she shares stories about the previous parsonage residents. Chris told me that small church gatherings were once held in the, the house's front parlor and large dining room, especially in the winter when the pastors did not wish to heat both the house and the church. Chris loves to ask questions about the house at those moments when her hands are in my mouth and I cannot respond. So she says, have you heard them when they chat during those meetings in your living room? Mm -hmm. She was not the first person to tell me that some of the former pastors and parishioners were truly still in residence. After my friend Chris and her husband moved to the family property on the shore, they sold the old parsonage to a couple from New Jersey who would stay only in the summer. They acquired the house, the, when I acquired the house 10 years later, I created a list of their recent improvements that needed to be undone. <laughs> First to go were the overgrown shrubs that enveloped the front porch. In the process, however, we disturbed a robin's nest. 
I had already noticed that there were very few songbirds on the island, and I'd hoped that this bird was not discouraged from staying in the area. One of my Southport friends had expressed her concerns that the Wiscasset nuclear power plant, <laughs> sorry Kate, <clears throat> gets worse, <laughs> up the Sheepskit River on the island's west side might be responsible for the bad air over the island, causing the increasing cancer rate in humans and the noticeable lack of small birds nesting in our trees. It's important to note Rachel's Carson's property is exactly in that path of wind. And she died of cancer, nothing to do with the power plant. But it is unique that that's where she wrote Silent Spring. And I knew none of that when I was first at the house. In contrast, local seagulls did not appear to be negatively affected by any environmental conditions. <laughs> their population appeared abundant and hearty. The gulls extracted with precision their daily shellfish diet from the nearby ocean waters. In addition to their natural diet, each day my neighbor Franny placed small tins of cat food just outside her front door. As she set the can on the ground, she would call out the name of the largest gull I had ever seen. He was well fed on cat food. <laughs> Babe, dinner time, she would shout. Babe, come now. You could hear her everywhere. <laughs> to anyone passing by, the call meant as a warning not to go too close while the gulls swarmed in for their daily treat. Between meals, Babe and her winged buddies would sit on the road and dare cars to get close, mm -hmm. taking flight at the last safe moment. They liked to chase the passing vehicles, especially convertibles, <laughs> up the road, flying very close overhead like small drones. Mm -hmm. They would pass my house while I'd be out gardening. Mm -hmm. It was a mood. I'd often sit on the granite block at the edge of my garden just to take in the view across the field and breathe in a good dose of fresh island air. In the summer, my dad's old metal wheelbarrow is parked nearby and filled with pots of black-eyed Susans. An old cigar box is nestled between the flower containers, and the note on the lid reads, six dollars per plant, only five if you return the pot. This reminder has never failed to solicit the appropriate offerings from the islanders and the visitors who stop to buy a bit of joy from the soil of Southport Island. The pods from hundreds of bright yellow flowers self-seed each winter, providing an abundant display of color for the next summer. Each fall I dig and divide and pot the large root clusters to have them ready in place in the wheelbarrow by July of the next year. Now known is the house with the yellow flowers. The old Methodist parsonage has earned its new name. Mm -hmm. An author's note on this, and, and Barb was good to, to introduce this part, this was written in Barb's class in a very different form, so what you have in the book is different. It's more of a research piece. This is part of the story of series, and there is one on the family of Robins, and they arrived a week ago, we're still there. Um, there is one about the man who I found in my yellow flowers one day, who came back and moved in and lived there for a year and a half. There are stories about Gus Pratt, if any of you have ever been to Cozy Harbor, um, and, and stories that Gus told me, that I'm not sure he told anyone else. So they're all forming into a book, and I have to thank Barb for that. Mm -hmm. In the process of that, we have reached out to save the Ruth Lepper Gardner House as a center for art and science education. So, shamelessly, I have brochures over on the table. <laughs> you are welcome to grab one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Part of the, the fun of these stories is hearing about times that are no longer with us and, and things that we took for granted maybe then or those people back then took for granted but seem so uh, unusual and, and um, alien to us, to, to people who have not experienced that. So thank you, Nancy. That was great. Next we have Peg Coulon, Margaret Coulon, who's going to read a story uh, called A Wee Bit of Fun. Mm -hmm. Peg moved to Booth Bay Harbor about a year ago now, one year ago, from northern Maine. And she's been sharing stories about her life, her former life in, in um, northern Maine. But this story takes place fairly recently, doesn't it? She 
teaching. I thank you all for being here. Can I sit down now? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> I've never done this before. Since God allows drivers of motorized vehicles, why aren't ones provided? <laughs> On March 15, I finally dared to drive my car to downtown Booth Bay. Um, to downtown Booth Bay via Oak Street. One way, major route. 25 miles per hour is way too fast there. <laughs> it was my first time driving after an eight week recovery from a medical emergency. A late model black jeep was in front of me. Suddenly it stopped in the middle of the street. Okay. Then its backup lights glowed and when I tooted my horn it still rolled on back. Frantically I shifted to reverse but checking behind me I did check. <laughs> were at least seven cars, all stopped, fairly close together. Six feet snowbanks on each side left me a certain target. Oh, yes, smash. Parking the Jeep, parking, the Jeep driver and I were surveying a smashed front end of my car and a dislocated fender of her Jeep. She said, I was just trying to find a parking spot. Because of the damage, I insisted on calling Booth Bay Harbor Police. While we waited, she came to me and asked, do you knit? <laughs> replied in a dubious voice, <coughs> excuse me, I know a few stitches, but I'm not an accomplished knitter. She said, I'd love to have you join my meeting with on those mornings at the restaurant downtown. Well, well, we were strangers. I am so angry, but trying not to be unpleasant. But truthfully, lady, would you want me to come with sharp pointed needles? <laughs> I didn't see that, but wow, did it go through my mind. <laughs> when the police arrived with two other first responders, she told them she had a blind spot and didn't know anyone was behind her. Now, I'll tell you, we have a deaf, blind, blonde, on our streets. <laughs> However, she does have good insurance. A probably nice knitting group and a black Jeep. Watch out. <laughs> Giselle Moreto um, is going to read a story called A Dream Come True. And come on up, Giselle, please. I want to thank Pat, I mean, Barb. <laughs> you can tell him the rest. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Barb and Sweden for this opportunity. Likewise, uh, with the pay that it's my first uh, um, reading in public. <laughs> um, this is a story that uh, of a time, of a moment in time that was very special to me. And is it coming through all right? Yeah. Okay. The dream come true. I awoke to a feeling of wet warmth on a beautiful fall Sunday morning. 
I was in my ninth month pregnancy, and I knew it was time. My water had broken. I wasn't in distress or in a lot of pain and thought, if this is what it's going to be like, it will be a piece of cake <laughs> compared to the severe dysmenorrhea I had endured for so many years. The excruciating back pain, abdominal cramps, and unrelenting vomiting often put me in bed for at least 48 hours. Now I, now I decided to take a, a shower. Now I decided to take a shower and wash my hair and get made up as if I were going to a party. <laughs> After all, the pregnancy had gone very well, and I'd been spared the morning sickness in the first trimester. So it seemed like my labor might follow suit. I was having a I was having regular contractions a few minutes apart, but still feeling relatively comfortable. We called the obstetrician and gave him the stats, and he in instructed us to head to the hospital. Excuse me, I just realized why I'm having a little trouble here. I have to change my glasses. <laughs> We grabbed my bag and my husband and I drove down to St. Vincent's Hospital in Manhattan for, from my mom's place in Brooklyn. Because it, was early, because it was an early Sunday morning, there was no traffic and I was, it was an easy drive in. We had no problem finding a parking space in front of the hospital. As I proceeded to patient registration, I kept my fingers crossed and prayed that I would have the opportunity to get one of, one of the two birthing rooms. I was so looking forward to having my first birth experience in a birthing room's at-home environment. Since there were only two rooms of this kind, they were assigned on a first-come, first-served basis at the time of your arrival, and you could not reserve one ahead of time. I was ecstatic when I realized that the one that one was available and my mind was put at ease. Once I settled into my room, an obstetrics nurse came in, examined me, hooked me up to a number of different wires to monitor my vitals and contractions, and set me up with a baby monitor. After the examination, she informed me that I was only in the very early stages of dilation and had to go and had a way to go before the baby's arrival. My obstetrician wasn't on duty that morning, so I was seen by the head of obstetrics. He reaffirmed that I wasn't dilated enough and insisted my, that my water had not broken. I knew he was wrong. That wasn't urine. <laughs> Apparently, the baby's head had sealed off the placental sac, preventing all the fluid from escaping. He stated that my choices were to return home until it was time to deliver or to proceed with a C-section. I was appalled at his suggestion of doing a C-section and felt like he wanted to rob me of this beautiful experience, only so he could get home for Sunday dinner. After the months I had spent studying up on the process and experience of birth and delivery, and the pros and cons of various procedures, I would only consider having a C-section as a very last resort or because it became a medical necessity. I desired to have the experience of natural birth and wanted only what was best for my baby. Therefore, I opted to wait it out at my mom's apartment and headed back to Brooklyn. Back at my mom's place, the long hours seemed to be unending. The contractions were intensifying and the pain was becoming unbearable. But I dared not return to the hospital too soon for fear that I would end up with a C-section. 
I was determined not to let this doctor spoil it for me or my baby. Finally, I could bear it no longer. The contractions were coming fast and strong, so we headed back to the hospital. This time it went by taxi, as I was in too much pain and needed help through the contractions. As we arrived again, I wondered and hoped that I would be able to score the birthing room. God had blessed us, and we ended up back in the same room. The nurse and the doctor came in again, examined me, and informed me that I was still not dilated enough. This time they inserted a hook to release the rest of the amniotic fluid and help my labor to progress. But it still did not have much of an effect on the dilation of the cervix. Again, the doctor tried to convince me to have a C-section, but I refused. As I was laying there groaning in pain, I could hear them discussing my case. Since I, was, since I wasn't ready to give birth yet, the doctor was telling the nurse that I would need to be transferred to the general maternity floor so that they could free up the room. Oh no, not again, I thought. <laughs> then I heard the doctor say, if she is going to be so noisy, we won't be able to put her on the general maternity <laughs> That was all I needed to hear. And from then on, I couldn't hold back any of my groans. <laughs> As we settled in for the evening, my mom arrived to stay with me and relieve my husband. The painful contractions continued to intensify, and as the night went on, were later accompanied by the all too familiar, familiar excruciating low back pain and unrelenting vomiting. It was as if my dysmenorrhea had returned with a vengeance. <laughs> later that evening, my doctor arrived. I told him of my experience with the other doctor and begged him not to leave me in another doctor's hands. The labor kept me up all night, and I wasn't able to get any sleep. Early the next morning, when my doctor came to see me, I still wasn't quite ready. So he gave me medication to help me sleep and let, me, let my body recuperate. By morning, I still wasn't there. Yet, so he, so he exacted. By morning, I still wasn't there yet, so he administered Pitocin to help move things along. I was out like a light in no time, but soon after, I sat up in bed and exclaimed, The baby's coming out! <laughs> the nurse ran in and said, Let me examine you. Suddenly, things moved very quickly. Without saying another word, she ran out, grabbed my doctor, who was about to depart, rushed him into the room, and threw a gown on him. They told me not to push, while they put my feet in the stirrups and got into position. The, door, the doctor did an episiotomy, and then it was finally time to push. After the second try, my baby finally arrived. She was a beautiful little girl just as I had hoped for. The nurse laid her on my chest, and she latched right onto my breast, while the doctor sewed up the tear resulting from the birth. After we were cleaned up, we were transferred to the maternity floor. I was exhausted, but ecstatic. After 32 hours of labor, my dream came to be. <laughs> So our next storyteller you already know something about because his wife was telling stories about him. They actually worked together pretty amazingly. They were both in the same class together, which I was really dubious about. Like, how could they write stories and have their significant other in the same room? But it worked. It was great. 
And Dave McCold, who lives with Pat McCold in East Booth Bay, um, and um, is a former surgeon, um, is going to read you a story called Loss and the Maple Leaves. <laughs> excited in the OB ward and she thought the doctors and the nurse were saying, I think she's going to die late tonight. <laughs> I just got back from Baltimore where at my advanced age I still have a job for one day a month and I stay with our granddaughter in Baltimore and uh, our daughter and son-in-law. <clears throat> and as I went into the room last night, there was a book, and it said, Jokes that Grandfathers Can Tell. <laughs> so I pulled out a card, and the first one was, You notice how those Russian dolls are so full of themselves? Laws <laughs> <laughs> and Maple Leaves. From the patient's room on the fourth floor of the hospital, I could see a maple tree on the yard next door. It was a huge yellow maple. But from the fourth floor, looking straight down, it looked like a miniature tree. It was fall. I saw the patient in that room daily over several weeks. My attention often drifted, drifted out the window where I could see that many of the uh, yellow leaves had fallen to the ground. With the tiny le little uh, tiny leaves scattered around, and yet an abundance of leaves still on the tree, it looked like an artist had splattered paint onto the ground while painting the tree. The image's beauty staggered me. Each day, more of the yellow was on the ground, ringing the base of the tree. It was as if I were viewing a painting that changed from day to day. I visited the patient most days, and so more and more of those leaves were on the foot of the tree, and fewer were on the limbs. The image stayed just as strong, just changing. One day, with no warning, all of the yellow splattered. The base of the tree was gone. It was a visual shock. All the color had been ripped from my sight. Now the tree appeared barren. I felt lost. I felt sad. My attention returned to that patient in the bed whom I was visiting as often as I could. He looked terrible. He had end-stage liver disease. The day that the leaves were gone, he looked up at me and said, I'm getting to the top of the hill. What an unusual way for a renowned forensic pathologist to say, I'm dying. He had been surrounded by death from illness and trauma his whole life, but had to say it metaphorically in regards to himself. When his wife had died from heart valve surgery, that's Pat's mom, just nine months earlier, he told me, she's being cremated, but I've got the heart. He was devastated by her death, and on the other hand, he could continue that relationship briefly by examining her heart as her pathologist to understand what had happened. Her art, I think, was also a symbol of his love for her. It occurred to me that this was the time to say goodbye. Russ, it's been my privilege to be your son-in-law. It's been my privilege too, he said quickly. He had been my professor in medical school, and I had married his oldest daughter 17 years earlier. We did not get to see him as much as we wanted. He worked very long hours as the chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland and the city of Baltimore, and in his private lab. And he'd spent many of his off hours with his buddies. I had wanted to spend more time with him. I rarely got to go fishing or hunting with him. 
which I enjoyed, but only when his friends couldn't go, <laughs> he'd call me. And I knew my wife had wished for more time with him too as a young girl. Because of this, I made sure I spent time with our children. When I finished work, I went right home and read books to them at night and saw them and spent time on a weekend. I totally missed the diagnosis of my father-in-law's alcohol dependence until it was too late. I probably could not have done anything about it because he was in denial. But I was angry that I didn't get a chance to do that, and I still regret it. But now, after some 30 years, I just miss him. The next year, I took my wife up to that same room, and I showed her the yellow maple tree and the leaves below on the ground. Now she is an artist, a good artist, and she appreciated the perspective and the colors on and around the tree. I told her that the room reminded me of her father, but it helped me to kind of remember the tree, and that would be there for years, and we could say goodbye to the leaves, but see them again and again. <laughs> some laughs, but also some sadness. Chris is going to read a story. Chris Chapman um, is our last reader. She's going to read a story that I think connects everybody in this room and, and everybody actually in this country. Um, Chris is a Damascotta native, although she lives now in Harpswell and Noubleboro, I guess as your camp in Noubleboro in the summer. Um, she grew up at Chapman Farm, which is where In Along the Way has um, its project going on. And they have very nicely hosted one of the, the writing groups, and that's how Chris and I got connected there. So, Chris, would you like to read to us? Um, I actually forgot to write down the title. Remember. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> Remembrance, <laughs> Jan walked into my ceramics classroom, put your computer on the news feed. Incomprehensible. None of us had experienced anything like this, and now our nation was reeling. My high school students and I shared that horrific moment when we learned that two planes had flown into the World Trade Center and both towers had collapsed. My ceramics class was drawing shells, but following a curriculum did not feel right. Nothing did. Wait a minute, I'm just thinking, our heels, stop drawing, get their hands in clay. So I did. I told them, hold the ball of clay, let your feelings guide you. What resulted was not important, doing it was. I think that moment planted the seed. I felt compelled to do something to honor the significance of what had happened. I couldn't let it go. I thought of making a pot for every life lost, but as the death count rose, I knew that was impossible. Still searching for a way to respond, haunted by the horrors of an experience none of us could have imagined. Every humble offering that crossed my mind seemed to fall short. An event that had stunned us all so deeply, it created a reality shift. Our tectonic plates had moved without warning in the aftershock of helplessness too great to be ignored. <clears throat> Unable to sleep, the clock read 3 a.m. As I crawled out of bed, got a sketchbook and began to calculate. How many had died? New York, Shanksville, the Pentagon? At least 5,000 is the estimate. Those astronomical numbers were not just a number, but a life. Maybe I couldn't make a memorial object for everyone who perished, but my school community could. All mm -hmm. rooms met just once a week. How many kids in the school? How many weeks to make 5,000 objects? My sketchbook was full of numbers and scratchy sketches when my alarm rang at 6 a.m. I was still floating when the high school art department met for our daily lunch meeting. I told them about my idea and asked for their input and support. Richard, Sheila, and Cooper were on board and willing to help however they could. Next, I approached my principal with a plan to present to the faculty. He was excited by the possibilities and the Remembrance Project became a reality after the next faculty meeting. 
what the school community did was heroic. It was successful because we all needed to do something real to fill our whole of horror. A malignancy with no precedent to show us a way to heal. That's when I felt I was being channeled by some power beyond my own abilities. Usually an indecisive person, always questioning and searching for a way, better way, I was driven by a clarity that told me this idea was my mission. I proceeded without hesitation and was carried by the belief that some healing could occur if I persevered. My students and I met after school. We made supply kits for each of the 88 home rooms, containing a big Ziploc bag holding 65 balls of clay, paper towels, an empty egg cart for size limits, and a user's guide. Over the course of the next month, four home room meetings, students made their tokens of shared loss from play. During that 20 minute period, over a thousand students and their home room teachers took a ball to play, held it, and responded to what they felt when they thought about the 9 11 attacks. They would make that clay object a squished form, a cell phone, praying hands, a letter, a plane, a cross, a firefighter's helmet, a broken heart. What it was did not matter, only that it was. I brought the clay to all the staff, aides, secretaries, kitchen workers, custodians, bus drivers. This was for the entire down area at high school community. We used a variety of clay bodies, porcelain, tan, brown, terracotta, white. I fired them to, a different, to different temperatures to achieve a range of color and better reflect the humanity of the loss. As the weeks went on, the case filled with stacks of our offerings. The display case was in the lobby, and it was getting filled, and we were only halfway to our goal. Then something uncanny happened. The freestanding display case must have been bumped, and all the stacks had tumbled down, becoming nothing more than a pile of rubble. It became apparent that the project could not stop there. Having gone to graduate school in New York City, I had been to the Twin Towers many times. I had a photograph of my parents and me taken on the observation deck of the 110th floor of the South Tower. I had been to dinner in the windows of the World Restaurant on the top of the North Tower. I had memories that made the magnitude of their destruction really belong to belief, even though I had watched them flatten like a stack of pancakes. I was laser focused at this point. What would it take to have the Remembrance Project become the Remembrance Pillars. I started by calculating how tall 110 floors of our clay offerings would be. 22 feet, too tall for an interior space. So we had to build it outside. I consulted two engineers, one for BIW and one for Bright Pierce. What structural considerations were needed to have two 22 foot pillars withstand winds and weather? What size concrete bases were needed? Once I had those answers, I felt confident to forge ahead. The plan was to have two pillars, each like the twin tower, <coughs> with 110 foot floor, or the 110 floors made from eight-inch plexiglass. The floors would slide down the steel columns, supported and separated <coughs> by PVC spacers. For me, it was like stacking a giant kiln with shelves and posts. What happened next was unprecedented. I was preparing for some major fundraising. But every place I called asking for help said yes. No fundraising was needed. It seemed everyone I spoke with wanted to help. It was a sign of a time when our collective consciousness needed to do something. And somehow the Remembrance Project was still in that need. I called American Steel Company for the 20-foot long Schedule 80 steel pipes, which they sent to the school on a fat, flat bug bed truck. They had to be transferred to the technical high school on a school bus. The welding instructor there had agreed to let one of our mutual students cut and weld the pipes to make the required height. That same student agreed to cut the PVC pipes donated by E.J. Prescott into 442 and one-third inch pieces. <laughs> you know what he got that year for. <laughs> Next came the plexiglass. We needed 220 pieces with four holes drilled in each one. Portland Glass donated them when I asked for a quote. Things were falling into place, and there was an urgency to get the pillars built before the ground froze. For all Miller Construction came to our rescue. A site in front of the school near the pond was designated, and the crew came to install the two sauna tubes and erect the 26 steel pipes, 26 foot steel pipes into the uh, four feet deep. 
Then William Scott Creek came and poured the foundations. It was quite a sight to see a construction truck with ropes holding up these towering pillars as you drove into school the next Monday. Arborist Tim Vale and his son Wes, a former ceramic student of mine, brought their cherry picker to install the floors of the two pillars. Students from the art classes brought the floors filled with the clay tokens outside, 220 of them covered the lawn. The PVC spaces were glued on them and handed to Wes. He slid them down with steel pipes until our remembrance pillars became a reality. As the floors of the tokens grew, they appeared to be ascending skyward. Randomly placed, somehow a clay airplane was at the point of impact. An eerie reminder of the impetus of our remembrances. The dedication took place on December 11, 2001. Guests included local fire and police departments, first <coughs> responders and EMTs, all the donors, construction crew, and engineers who helped make it happen, along with the public. A student group of tribal drummers created a primal sound that morning as homeroom teachers silently led their students around the pond, a pilgrimage of over a thousand, came to stand before their memorial. Our student speaker reminded us that a piece of each one of us is right next to each other in these pillars. Made from clay so malleable, it could transform our gestures into something permanent. The chorus performed, May You Go Forth in Love, as beautiful sounds wafted skyward. English teacher Mary Lee Wild gave the dedication, quote, In peace, each one of us has found a place in this beautiful family we have become. All of us have a tangible way to express our sadness, our anger, our fears. Our Remembrance Project pillars stand 22 feet tall near a pond on the school campus, a visible reminder of their profound meaning. The Remembrance Project gave us permission to acknowledge what we were feeling, to express those feelings in clay, and to offer them up to be part of the symbol of hope. The pillars are fitting memorials of our vulnerability and of our strength. They are monuments to our strength of community, to the resilience of the human spirit, and to the unity of the United States in which we live, end quote. Twin trumpets echo taps across the pond. We pass by the pillars looking up, searching for our own, and as its collective power towered over us, we silently walked back to class. Yet something had changed. We had just participated in an act of grace. For months after that, people came to visit the Remembrance Pillars. They said they felt obliged to do something. And that is how it happened, the need of so many to do something, that and trusting that art is the power to heal. The Remembrance Pillars still stand on the Mount Eric campus in Thompson, Maine. Thank you.